This slack can be utilized as a part of the beam. It functions as the flank of the beam. A typical flank beam comprised of a reinforced concrete beam plus a section of the slab. It can be in the form of T-shape or in the form of L-shape. The flank is beneficial to the beam in terms of the moment resistance. It alters the section property, increase the beam strength and lead to a smaller area of tensile steel area. However, we need to provide transverse steel in the flank in order to ensure it function properly. To further understand the principle of the flame beam, you need to know these two terms, the sagging moment and honking moment. The sagging moment refers to a condition where the beam bends downward. It has tension at the bottom part of the beam and compression on the top part of the beam. As for the slab, which is located at the top part of the beam, it undergoes compression. The hogging moment is a condition where the beam bends outward. The compression will be below the beam, and the tension will be on top of the beam. The slab will be undergoing tension and there will be cracking. Under such circumstances, the slab cannot function as a flame. Therefore, a rectangular section is considered. In principle, a beam can be considered as a flame beam, either T or L beam, when it is undergoing sagging moment. As for the hogging moment, a rectangular section is assumed. This diagram shows us how the effective width of the flank is determined. It is determined based on these equations. In principle, the T flank is determined by the summation of B effective 1 plus B wet plus B effective 2. As for the L flank beam, the B effective 1 plus B of the web will be considered as the B effective of the L beam. The B effective of the flank is determined by using this equation. It is assumed 20% of B1 plus 0.1% of L0. This summation should be less than 20% of L0. And theoretically, it should be less than the BI. This BI represents half of the clear distance between the adjacent beam. As for the L0, it represents the distance from zero moment to the next zero moment. The L0 vary among different conditions of the beam as presented by this diagram for the end span, for the intermediate span and for cantilever. The equations are given here. It is noted that this diagram is applicable when the L3 is less than half of the L2 and the ratio of adjacent span length is within 0 0.67 to 1.5. Next, we come to the design of the flame beam. First of all, you need to know the differences in terms of design of a rectangular beam and the design of a flame beam. The design of a rectangular beam involves designing the main reinforcement bar for the beam. As for the flame beam, you need to design the main reinforcement bar and also design the transverse reinforcement. The designs that involve Checking the stress block within the flank. Determine the area of reinforcement. 
and design for the transverse reinforcement. The flow chart here summarizes the design process of a flame beam. First, you need to determine whether the stress flow is within the thickness of the slab. This is very important in order for you to determine the moment resistance of the beam. Based on the principles of stress plot diagram, the beam moment resistance is determined by FST multiplied Z here for the T flank when the stress plot is within the flank. In case that the stress flow is beyond the thickness of the flank, the moment resistance of the beam it will be equal to the force generated by the flank multiplied Z1 and the force generated by the web multiplied Z2. Let us go through the equation one by one. First, we need to determine the location of the S to be compared with X. The S is determined by this equation where the lever arm is determined by the common lever arm equations and the K is obtained from the typical K factor formula. You are to check whether the S is within the height of the flank or is beyond the height of the flank. If the stress block is within the flank, that means the first condition is applied. You may go straight to the typical equations for determining the reinforcement area of the beam. If the stress block is found exceeding the flank height, that means there will be part of the stress block that is actually within the beam web. Therefore, there will be two sectional area to be considered. You need to calculate the force generated by the flank and force generated by the web separately. The force generated by the flank is determined by multiplying the area with the compressive strength, the design compressive strength of the concrete. The Z1 will be determined by the distance from the centroid to the reinforcement bar. As for the compressive strength of the web, is determined by the cross-sectional area of the web multiply Z2, which is from the centroid of the compressive region to the centroid of the reinforcement bar. Substitute the design moment into the equations and you will get an unknown of SW. That means the height of the stress block in the web. This will be later be substituted into another equation which is made of sigma fx is equal to zero. With that you will be able to get the required AS. In principle, the design step is easier when the stress block is within the flank. When the stress block falls within the web, you will have to work out the solutions by using the first principle. Next, we need to design for transverse reinforcement. It is required to resist the shear load contributed due to the bending deformation of the beam. The shear stress is actually generated by the differential forces contributed by two different ends of the beam. And the one highlighted in pink color is considered as the shear plane. The transverse reinforcement is applied perpendicularly to the shear plane. The shear resistance of the reinforcement bar contribute in resisting the shear load. The differences between the forces at both ends is considered as the data FD. 
It is generated due to the relative movement or elongation of the member during bending. In principle, the longitudinal shear stress is considered at its maximum when the DMDX is at maximum. DMDX represented the gradient of the moment bending moment diagram. The maximum gradient usually occurred when M is equal to zero for saggy moment at mixed band and when M is at its maximum for hoggy moment at the support. Next you need to know another two more unknown known as data X and data M. You will need this data M and data X for you to compute the shear stress. First of all, you need to identify the distance from zero moment to the maximum moment. For a simply supported beam, the distance between zero moment to maximum moment is considered as L per 2. Data x it will be half of this distance. As for the continuous beam, the distance between zero moment to maximum moment will have to be determined from the bending moment diagram. The data x it will be half of its distance. As for the data m, it will be the regional moment happening when it is at data x. Same goes to the continuous beam. This flowchart shows the design process of the transverse reinforcement. First, you need to determine whether the transverse reinforcement is required or not. In principle, if the shear stress is less than 40% of the design tensile strength of the concrete, no shear reinforcement is required. Therefore, you just need to provide a nominal reinforcement. The nominal reinforcement is determined by the minimum amount of reinforcement bar. The design tensile stress of the concrete is determined from this equation which is in the function of SCTK divided by factor of safety of concrete. You may obtain FCTK from table 3.1 in Eurocode. Next, you need to determine the shear force of the beam by using this equation. The delta FD is determined by this equation while BF node represents the effective flank out of the beam. If you find your shear load is greater than 40% of your FCTD, that means shear reinforcement is required. In this case, you need to determine the shear angle by using this equation. Next, you need to identify if the flank is undergoing tension or compression. The shear angle should fall within this range. When the angle is smaller than this, this number will be adopted. When the angle is greater than 45 degree, the member is likely to fail. The shear load should be less than the equation given here. And the required transverse reinforcement bar will be given in this equation.